I really was not a good wife in the sense I wasn't submissive, um, wasn't respectful. I was, again, living a life of sin, living at church one thing, and he was pastoring and at home another thing. And um, it, you know, now that I'm a believer, it really haunted me what Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, what you are at home is what you are. Welcome to another Do Lost View. Today we have a very special guest, Susan Heck, a woman that God is using to establish his kingdom on earth. And uh, one really good thing about her is that she's memorized the entire New Testament. So we definitely have to talk about how she's done that. And uh, she's just been a blessing to our church and uh, she continues to be a blessing to women worldwide. So Susan, thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Levi. Looking forward to it. All right, all right. <clears throat> So let's just start at the beginning. What was your upbringing like? Did you have a Christian background, pagan? Uh, you know, what was okay. what was it like? Well, my dad was a pastor here, actually in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He uh, started a church, and so I grew up in a fundamental Baptist church, independent Baptist church. He also founded Moody Christian Academy, and uh, he was on television more watched than Oral Roberts, if you can believe that. Oh, called wow. Thy Kingdom Come. So I was brought up in a in a good home where I heard the gospel. My father was a graduate of Moody Bible Institute back then when Moody was a you know great school and um, so he taught the Bible uh, expositorily and so I grew up hearing the gospel mm. um, even though I was uh, saved and baptized three times I my life had really never changed until mm. the age of 30 when God saved me so wow so when you were going through that hearing the gospel being preached and you know, like you said expositorily mm -hmm. where it's detailed preaching mm -hmm. and sequential preaching and you had an appetite, for, you had some kind of appetite, I'm assuming, for the Word of God, but as a unbeliever, how, what was your appetite like before, you know, during You know, years? I read my Bible every day because I was, I was taught that that's what we did, and so I would read the Bible, sometimes read the Bible through every year. I would even have different people that mentored me, and I would answer questions, like inductive things, like who, what, when, where, hmm. but I was living a life of sin, really. Hmm. I mean, I, I got saved because I was terrified of hell, really. Mm. My dad didn't mince words in his preaching, and uh, he, was a, he was a good application teacher, too. So I was just terrified. I had a lot of fears as a child, fear of thunderstorm, fear of tornadoes, fear of, you know, just fear, fear, fear. And so I feared hell. Mm. And that was really my motivation for salvation, was I did not want to go to hell. So each time I got walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, I got baptized. I felt some relief, but hmm. I would just go back to my sin. Wow. So, so in some sense, you were just doing those things to make sure that you were keeping yourself out of hell, which, yeah. why, which is why you didn't have any, any yeah. relief. Because as according to the Bible, you can't do any works that get no. you out of hell. I never repented. I never saw myself as a sinner, ever. Hmm. I, I never remember crying over my sin or being moved about it. And I was I knew it was wrong, things I was doing that my parents didn't know about, but I... I never, I, the guilt didn't bring me to repentance, hmm. so. And so that's, I think, the major difference for people that we still are battling that mm -hmm. issue today where people don't realize that mm -hmm. hey, you got to have a conviction of sin. It's not yeah. about going to church, reading your Bible, looking like a good person or looking like a good Christian. It's about realizing that you are a sinner and that you deserve to go to hell. Exactly. And re realizing that it's the kindness of God, the goodness of God that mm -hmm. leads you to a, a true repentance. So we're thankful for that happening in your life. And in regards to that, where were you? Do you remember what happened exactly that kind of jolted you out of that false mm -hmm. sense of security? Yeah. Um, met my husband at the age of 18 <clears throat> at Moody Bible Institute. Mm -hmm. And Phil Johnson, some people might know, was his roommate. And hmm. my dad had baptized Phil. Phil went to my dad's church. Hmm. And um, so he told Doug, my pastor's daughter's coming here to go to school. And uh, I want you to missionary date her because she tends to get in with the wrong crowd. <laughs> so Doug said, okay. And um, so he did. And two weeks into our dating time, um, we, I was pretty much hooked. But... Um, so we got married, and, and the night before we got married, he almost called the wedding off because he began to wonder about my mm. salvation. Wow. And he began to see I had anger issues and um, just a lot of immaturity. Mm. And so there's things that he began to wonder about, my soul. But he married me anyway, and um, again, in my marriage, first 10 years of marriage, I really was not a good wife mm. in the sense I wasn't submissive. Um, wasn't respectful. I was, again, living a life of sin, living at 
church one thing and he was pastoring and at home another thing mm -hmm. and um, it you know now that I'm a believer it really haunted me what Charles Haddon Spurgeon says what you are at home is what you are and so what I was at home was not what I was at church so at the age of 30 the Lord in his kindness inflicted me with severe pain I ended up in a hospital uh, in Pryor Oklahoma where my husband was pastoring and uh, for two weeks I was in isolation mm -hmm. and another six weeks at home flat on my back and so dur it was a process where I began to no cell phones in that day no you know I didn't even think I had a TV in my room couldn't see the children mm -hmm. except through a window in the hospital there couldn't oh, see Doug goodness. and um, so when you're alone with no friends except my doctor who is an elder in our church <laughs> <laughs> and he would ask me how I was doing spiritually every time he saw me he'd ask mm -hmm. me so I began to have to look at myself. I mean, two weeks by yourself with nothing. And I was like, I am a hypocrite. Hmm. I am a big hypocrite. I am living a life of sin. And so sometime in that process, I remember being overcome with the guilt of my sin for the first time and seeing myself as a sinner, like I've sinned against God. And I remember during the process, you know, of all this, and I can't give you exact date, mm -hmm. but actually mourning and weeping and, and crying, not that that is proving salvation, but feeling a remorse and wanting to change the way I was living. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the time that I believe the Lord saved me at the age of 30. He drug me. <laughs> wow. He arrested me. I mean, he threw me in the bed for yeah. eight weeks and I had no choice but to think about my soul. I'm sure you look back at that time as that's, that, even though it's a terrible experience, it was a, a thankful experience that God used I am. That to force you to look at yourself and realize that I you am. were yeah. that hypocrite, like you, like you mentioned. Yep. And when I called my parents to tell them I was going to be baptized for the fourth and final time, <laughs> uh, my mom said, I'm not surprised I've seen the change in you. Wow. So that was encouraging. And of course, mm -hmm. Doug did. Mm -hmm. Doug began to see the changes in me. I wanted to start submitting to him. I began to put off my temper and... And I had to come to him and ask him for forgiveness for many, many things. And mm -hmm. he forgave me, of course. But so then the last, you know, after uh, we were married 46 years before the Lord took him. So 36 years of our marriage were, I would say, you know, Christ honoring, not without difficulty, right. but a, a good marriage. A good, wow. So Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. You mentioned Pastor Doug many times, and he was definitely a wonderful pastor, but by your own, your own testimony, your children's testimony, he was a, a great husband, a great father, loyal, always there for his children, even while being there for others, which is, to me, it just sounds impossible to be a, a great pastor <laughs> and a great husband, but God gives you the grace to do it. So what was it like being married to, to married to him for 46 years? Um, it was a great joy. And um, I, you know, I think of that song that says, I just had one, wish I had one more day, mm -hmm. but I know one more day wouldn't be enough. So I look forward to glory when mm -hmm. I can be with him. But um, he was a humble man. He was a patient man. He was uh, fun. He was funny. Uh, very, being married to Doug was like probably being married to John Calvin or Charles <laughs> Burton because he really read all the time. Mm -hmm. Doug read 12 to 16 hours a day and he never oh, slept goodness. much. So he'd be up in the night reading. Uh, he wanted to go to bed at night with the lights on so he could read. Mm -hmm. He was an avid reader. And when he passed, you know, his library is very extensive. And the, really what he had was only a smidgen. He had a Microsoft library, too, like the Microfish Reader. And I don't know how many thousands and thousands of volumes. But, but he read those books. Hmm. He devoured them. And the thing about Doug, he'd read a book, and I could say what's in there, and he could tell me exactly. He knew how to read a book and retain what he read. He also read massive amounts of Scripture. Um, I would say his habit was to read through the Bible try to three or four times a month. A month. Um, and so he could go wow. anywhere in Scripture. Like I could say, hey, where does it talk about in Leviticus about, you know, the woman's menstrual cycle? And he'll oh, that's Leviticus 16 about verse, you know, and he, he knew incredible. it. He knew the incredible. Scriptures. And so it was, it was intimidating. And I remember when the Lord finally, after the Lord saved me, it, I got, I have to quit being intimidated by my husband. And I went to him one day and I said, I just want you to know I'm not intimidated by you anymore. <laughs> and he was looked at me kind of weird, but it actually changed my relationship with the Lord because I started living my own relationship with Christ and mm -hmm. not trying to live that through him. But mm -hmm. um, he, he was a very, very unusual man, I, I believe. And I'm not just saying that because I was his wife, but... Mm -hmm. I, I don't know very many pastors like him. Yeah. He, he shepherded well his people, 
and his wife and his children and his grandkids. So and it was a huge blessing to be under his ministry, even if for, for yeah. us it was just a short time. But the testimony after testimony, people talking about it, just it's amazing to see yeah. what the Lord could do with one man who's really devours his word and tries to live it out. Yeah. And, and it really has blessed many people over the years with that. And I think part of that intimidation probably led you to <laughs> memorize the entire New Testament. We're not talking about memorizing Matthew and Mark and Luke. We're talking about Matthew all the way to Revelation mm-hmm. that you have memorized verse by verse. Yes. Um, so I'm not making that up, right? No, this no, is, that's true. <laughs> which, I mean, it's my yeah. blogging for people to hear that for the first time. But yeah. So just tell, tell us about that experience. Yeah, some people question that. Yeah. But I, I noticed my daughter on one of the, something wherever that was posted online, and she said, no, it's true. She said, I can testify. We It's a joke in our house, and we start a verse. Mom completes it. <laughs> um when I met Doug, he he encouraged me to, he had most of the New Testament memorized when I met him at the age of 18. And he encouraged me to memorize and asked me if I had. And I said, yeah, John three sixteen, the Romans road. And he goes, no, I'm talking about a book. Mm. So he encouraged me with his method. And I uh, memorized Colossians when I was 18 and um, used his method, which I found to be helpful. And then I didn't memorize again until the Lord saved me at the age of 30. I started picking up that habit. And it was then not because... Doug was encouraging me to, but because I wanted to. I, When God saved me, he went out to Master Seminary. He was in the first graduating class out there in the 80s. And when he was at seminary all day and the kids were in school, I just was like, I want to know the Bible. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just reading because I had to or I was a pastor's wife. Mm-hmm. I was so hungry. So I'd get the commentaries out. I'd, and so I started memorizing, uh, picking up that habit again. I think I started with First John. And uh, I don't know, I'd get First John done. I was like, well, I'm going to do another one. I'm going to do another one. And so I, I began, and I, I probably had nine, 15 books memorized in the New Testament. I thought, well, why don't you just set a goal? Just have a goal to finish the New Testament. And so I wanted to complete it by the time I was 55, but the Lord in, in His providence had me start traveling and speaking, and which mm-hmm. I never was planning to do that it just the lord opened those doors too Mm -hmm. for traveling and speaking and writing expository studies for women so Mm -hmm. anyway i finished the new testament i think it was three years ago and then i've memorized ecclesiastes since then i'm working on genesis now (laughs) uh finished chapter 12 and then i stopped a little bit just a few months or weeks ago to memorize isaiah 53 for in preparation for easter but so i just keep pressing on i don't know if i live to be 120 i can get it done (laughs) but i all done (laughs) I don't Man. think I'm going to live to be 120, but who knows? It's still, it's still amazing to see, because I think at some level you have to have a deep appetite, not I just do. for getting a goal done, but for ha- actually having the Word of God in you. Like the, like the Bible says, let the Word of Christ dwell with yep. you richly. I think that's part of your, yep. your motivation. And I'm still so hungry. I mean, I, I'm memorizing, I'm learning, but I was just with my daughter and her husband, and he's a pastor, and so I kind of saved up some of my theological questions for him, and it's I miss that about Doug. We had a relationship where we talked Bible, theology, ministry all the time. Mm-hmm. And I miss that a lot. So I have a son who's a pastor, son-in-law who's a pastor. And so between the two of them, they kind of help me out. <laughs> well, hopefully, with all the, my sure questions. I'm sure they can't compare to Doug, but I'm sure they're doing no, their best. No, no one compares to Doug. <laughs> yeah. so. So, but as, so you, you talked about how you started traveling and teaching. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that's, I would say, at least in this day, pretty unique about your ministry as a woman's Bible teacher is that you only teach women. You don't teach men at no. all. Mm-mm. And so could you just talk about that? If you're so gifted to teach, why are you, quote unquote, limiting yourself to just women, right. uh, you know, teaching women? Right. Um, because I believe that's what the scriptures you know, teach, and I believe the scripture is my authority. Um, Paul writes in 1 Timothy, these things are I write unto you that you might know how to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so 1 Timothy is written for that purpose, mm-hmm. that we might know how we behave in, in God's house when we gather. And then he says in chapter 2, I permit not a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man. Why? Because Adam was first formed, then Eve. And so there's a reason there. And then in 1 Corinthians, which is also written for the same reason, uh, church, government, what we should do. You know, that was in the chapter where the man was committing incest. And Paul says, put this wicked guy out. He also talks there about that women are to be silent. They're not to challenge the teacher that's preaching. And so um, those are my convictions. I know that that's not popular today. but And I've been persecuted for that. I've... Uh, 
Um, people have challenged me on it. People have tried to get men in there. I've made men mad because they can't stay in when there's like a plenary session with men and women and then the men have to leave so I can teach the women. Wow. Um, but that's okay. I, you know, Levi, what I've noticed is once a woman or a man makes one veer off of scripture or their convictions, it seems to spiral down to where they will open the door for more compromise, more compromise, and pretty soon they're the ones we see committing moral uh, adultery in some way, they're immoral or doctrinal um, departing from scripture. Mm-hmm. We're And we're seeing it all, mm-hmm. the, I mean, every week, every day, it seems like another one. I And so once I make one compromise, I think it's just gonna open the door to others. So I'm firm on that. I, I've been places where men have to be in because of security reasons, mm-hmm. men have to be in there to record. Uh, you know, I've been in foreign countries where I even called Doug long distance because I was in Honduras and these men drove their wives 12 hours in the rain from Guatemala to hear me teach. And there was nowhere for them to go. It's mm-hmm. pouring down rain. There's one shelter. Mm-hmm. I called Doug long distance. I go, what do you want me to do? And he goes, just Susan, just they're in the back. Just don't worry about it. You know? mm-hmm. So I'm not saying I, I, I obey the, the spirit of the, of the law and I try my best. There are times that I've had one church where the pastor said, I'm sorry, no one teaches my women unless I'm in here. Mm-hmm. So those are kind of awkward situations. <laughs> But uh, they don't happen very often, thankfully. Mm-hmm. So, but um, my my rule is that. So yeah, and I think the Lord honors your at least your conviction based on His word, yeah. which is clear. Where like you quoted First Timothy, where it goes, the women don't have the authority to teach the men Mm-mm. in the church, and this is how you ought to behave. Which, like yeah. you said, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, and the, we're not going to be um, loyal to what the Bible right. is saying. Then what are we? What are we right. doing church for? You know, we're not. Yeah. We're just like the world in that respect. Yeah. And so, um, so a lot of women would hear that and say, well, I mean, Susan, then what do we expect us to do? Just shut up and be quiet at church and never do anything at church. So wh- what exactly is the role for women in the church according to the scriptures? This is what you're standing on. Yeah. I, well, I can teach women. Old women teach young women. I'm definitely old. <laughs> <laughs> so I do teach Our Lady's Bible study. I disciple many women at our church. I disciple women in other states around the world even. I counsel uh, people in our church. Uh, last night I had a couple over from our church who Doug and I used to disciple together and when he passed away they wanted to continue to meet. So we're going through uh, a Thomas Watson book, Heaven Taken by Storm. And so the three of us are discussing it. We're talking to each other. There's nothing wrong with that. I, uh, We had a great time together. Um, so th- I feel nothing wrong even if after this interview you and I start talking about scripture and I say well I think it says there's nothing wrong with you and I talking about that, or and even if you might learn something from me, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's in the gathering of the assembly. So I think women can teach Sunday school to children. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd be a little bit leery about young men, like teenage boys. I don't know that that's wise. That's still, to me as a man, mm-hmm. uh, nursery, agape meals. We have mercy meals. We have, we have so many ways in our church that women can serve. Mm-hmm. So they can serve. And they can be a part. My husband had no problem with women being part of Q&A time. We had question and answer time, and mm-hmm. he had no problem with that as long as a woman didn't challenge his authority publicly. I think that's disrespectful to the office of a pastor. Uh, she can talk to him privately, mm-hmm. you know, afterwards or something. But I, I think we need to remember our role as women. And I think it's not just something that we are um, doing because we're living in some kind of chivalrous society or some kind of... Um, male dominates society no. because we just want to have males in charge and think men are best. It's because what God has prescribed. Exactly. I think a lot of people, I think today, people like your husband, people like John MacArthur, if the Bible had flipped it and said women ought to be preaching and teaching, they w- you would never hear John MacArthur's mm. name. You would never hear Pastor Doug mm. in the pulpit. You would never hear Pastor Chris or anybody mm. in the pulpit. And you would be a pastor, I'm sure, someday, mm. somewhere because the Bible said that. And that's really where it comes mm-hmm. down to. It's not that we hate women or you hate women or it's that you want them just to do what God has called them to do because God knows right. best, right? <laughs> right? And women will take over. That's just it. We will take over and that's what's wrong. That's why women are becoming more masculine and mm-hmm. men are becoming more feminine. And and it's not right. It's not God's order for us and created order. So, so outside of the church, do you <laughs> think women have a role as far as CEOs or uh, congressmen or senators? Do you have a view on that? Or what do you think? Well, I do. <laughs> it probably won't be possible. I don't think it's wise, mm-hmm. my humble opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Isaiah talks about in the latter days a woman will encompass a man, indicating that women will just kind of take over. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we see that in the biblical world with Deborah, uh, because of, there was a vacuum of male leadership, um, 
I think it's best for men to be in those positions of CEOs, president, vice president. However, would I say, could I say, go so far to say a woman is sinning if that happened? No. Mm -hmm. But I think the best for all of us would be if there would be men that are leading companies and things like that. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's sinful. I just think for me, it's not the best, you know? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And, mm -hmm. um, so regards regarding the, um, there's a passage <laughs> in Titus 2 that, I mean, when you read it, especially being in the, in the culture that we're in today where it's he heavily feminized and mm -hmm. feminism really is dominant, I think a lot mm -hmm. more than we realize. But it's, there's a passage in there that says that women should be keepers at home mm -hmm. and even obedient to their own mm -hmm. husbands. Just like you know, children ought to be obedient to their parents. So, how is that not sexist? <laughs> you know, because people are here like, how in the world are we supposed to? You know, what is "quote unquote" Paul thinking? It's Paul's words here that are right. making women seem as if they should just submit to their husband. And you even used a word a few times already that you said, "I need to, I need to be submissive to my husband." So, mm -hmm. how are women supposed to look at that and, and feel good about themselves, so 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 to speak? Yeah. Well, when you can realize that's God's high calling for a woman. I mean, your son was just in here. What do you want to do? Cuddle up on my lap. And he wanted to cuddle. And to me, that's a that was a wonderful calling to bear children. You know, we're, uh, as Paul says, and that the children are removed, or women are removed from the stigma of Eve by bearing children and ruling the house, uh, her sin that she committed. So I, to me, it was a joy to raise my children and to be a homemaker. And a woman, if they will admit it, love that. They love to be home. They love to cook. They love to provide a happy environment for their for their husband and their children that's how god wired us mm -hmm. and so i i mean it'd just be like i could look at you and say well it's a bum deal that you got to go out and work to the toil you know sweat and toil of your brow and you're gonna you know dust your and dust your <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't very exciting for adam either but that but for you you're like no that's where you find your joy in working mm -hmm. and providing for your wife and child and so my joy was when i was young was being doug's wife and mm. I love to cook and love to make my home peaceful and uh, and a place where he would feel at home and my kids. I loved it. Now now I'm not, and so my role now is to teach. Mm -hmm. According and I have teaching gifts and te uh, gifts of exhortation, and so I want to use those mm -hmm. as an older woman. So I don't think it's sexist at all. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and submission that that was hard for me because I'm very independent. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful Doug never micromanaged me, and he. He, he he loved me, but he didn't try to rule me in, mm -hmm. in that way. He led me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very thankful for that. And so submission was, was challenging, even though my mother was very submissive. But once I got the hang of it, I began to see the joy of it. And uh, I remember one time we were out to dinner with some friends of ours, and the husband looked at me and he said, your, your submission to your husband is a beautiful thing. And I was like, that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> then I got to know his wife and realized she wasn't. And I mm. thought, oh, he's probably saying, do you hear that? <laughs> you know? So, um, and, I, and I wanted to be an example to people in the church, mm. the body. I wanted the older women, the young women to see that that's a good thing to honor Doug. It's a good thing to submit to him. And, um, and I, I appreciated his headship. I miss it. Mm. I miss his leadership in my home and his headship. That's a rare statement today, especially, you know, coming from a wife. Um, but we thank God mm -hmm. that he did use you both to continue to be an example in the body and still an example, mm -hmm. even though he's in heaven right now. We still can look to you and look at your marriage of 46 years uh, and raising children that are also godly and following the Lord. And so I think that's a huge blessing. So we're going to take a short break. And then when we come back, we'll talk about how you are now not only a teacher, but also a biblical counselor. Okay. So. All right, so as I was saying, you're not a just a teacher of the Word of God, but you also a counsel woman, and you mentioned that uh, earlier. But um, there are Christian counselors, there's biblical counselors, and there's secular counsels, counselors. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us the differences between sure. those two? Because especially cr Christian and biblical, so people think Christian, but you know, what's the difference between those two? There's a huge difference. Mm. Um, when I got certified with what used to be NANC, which is now ACBC, National Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, about 20 years ago, um, the reason I did that was because, first of all, Doug saw that I had those gifts and he wanted me to get certified. And he's the one that actually taught a big group of us at our church. Mm -hmm. He went through all the teaching time and he taught us, went through the videos. And so I'm the only one out of that 20 that got certified. <clears throat> and um, But anyway, the reason besides him was the fact that their premise was they believed the Bible was sufficient 
and they believe what Peter wrote, that God's given us everything we need for life and godliness mm. in the scriptures. Mm. And so the, I wanted to be a part of something like that, that we could sit down and help people through the scriptures. We didn't have to go to a psychiatrist, a psychologist. We didn't have to medicate people. Mm. God's promised help and hope through the scriptures. And every problem that we face today is in the Bible, pretty much, everything. And so I, I wanted to do that. So the difference, I would say even in Christian counseling, because I, I counseled a gal one time, and she said, I've been to many Christian counselors. You're the first one that's told me I'm in sin. Hmm. And I said, well, then you haven't been to a good counselor, because she was in sin. But they were, they were justifying it, minimizing her sin. Well, it's your husband's fault. He was an alcoholic. It's, it's this. It's all this. Instead of her owning up, to her sin. Hmm. And I think about what Ezekiel says, no longer ch can the children say, my parents, my parents made me do this, or my parents' fault. We have to, every man is responsible for his own sin, hmm. sinful choices. And so uh, Christian counselors don't do that. They will minimize the sin, they'll justify, they'll blame shift. Um, sometimes they'll do behavior modification, you know, type, type therapy. Um, sometimes they'll even recommend psychotropic drugs, which are dangerous to the mind. Mm. And so I would say that's the difference between uh, biblical counseling and Christian. And then psychiatry and psychology even goes further. You know, they'll do shock treatment. They'll Their main thing is drugs. They drug them up and, mm -hmm. and also they keep them coming back. Mm -hmm. You know, $100, $200 shots a pop every time you come back and it's a, a never-ending thing. Whereas when I went was certified, one of the things I was told was, if you can't help somebody in six weeks, you probably can't help them. I mean, mm -hmm. after six weeks of really giving them tools from the Bible on how to overcome anger, depression, whatever is their issue, they should start, if they have the Holy Spirit, being able to make some changes. Mm -hmm. So, whereas Christian counseling, I believe they probably keep you coming back, you know. Um, and I, I do counsel people long term because they want it. I, I try to say, hey, we're done, but they go, no, we still want to meet. And I go, okay, that's fine. <laughs> so, yeah. But I would definitely say there's a huge difference. Huge. So, I mean, yeah, just to think of, because when you hear a Christian, you, you assume <laughs> that they understand the, the evil of sin and the grip of sin and mm -hmm. how even Jesus said that if, if whoever commits sin, you're a slave of sin. Right, and right. And so to not deal with issues like worry or like anxiety or... Um, mm -hmm. Alcohols and whatever the issue mm -hmm. you're dealing mm -hmm. with, and not deal it with a deal it deal it right. you know, in the light of sin and judgment and hell right. is kind of mind-boggling to think that Christian counselors don't understand that concept. Right. So I don't know. But when you think about Christian, what is a Christian? You know what I'm saying? Mm. So if I'm going to go to a Christian counselor, what do they term Christianity? Because we've watered the gospel down so much, mm. <clears throat> they may not believe in the lordship of Christ. They may not believe in repentance. So you could have a Christian counselor who is in a false church, you know, a word of faith church, a Catholic church, some, you know, something like that. Mm. But yet they'll call themselves a Christian counselor mm. because they'll say they're Christian, but they don't even have the gospel right. So that's one of the things I appreciated about <clears throat> who I'm certified with. They, the gospel is the gospel, the mm. true gospel. And so that would be a definite difference between biblical counseling and Christian counseling. Yeah, I appreciate that distinction. That's, and that's, I think, why biblical counseling really has taken mm -hmm. off and grown over the years as people realize that their issue really is m most of the time it's in it. Now, they're not, as far as I've read, they're not an they're not like anti-drug <laughs> or anything like that. No, they, some, I mean, I, I never have recommended drugs to anybody mm -hmm. uh, just because before the Lord, I have, I have would have trouble with my conscience doing that in the sense that so many scriptures are replete with be sober, be sober, be sober, be mm -hmm. of sound mind, be self-controlled. And so I know the Bible allows, you know, take wine if you're sorrowing or you're getting ready to die or you're going through a deep depression or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I would say it, you can't forbid it, but I just don't ever recommend it because I guess in, in the studies that I've done uh, and going to these counseling conferences and listening to doctors talk about psychotropic drugs and long-term side effects, MS, Parkinson's, ticks. Uh, I even counseled a woman one time that had ticks mm. in her face. It was, and she was on anti-anxiety uh, medication, which that's a symptom. So for me, I don't want to make their problem worse. Mm. I want to teach them how to trust God in their issue and help them to overcome it through. Because He promises that. I mean, He promised. Even David going through all of his stuff. Look at the Psalms. I mean, it's horrible. All the stuff. Mm. You know, people betraying him and people after him. And yet at the end, He says, "But I'm going to trust in you." Mm. He doesn't say, I'm going to take a drug. I'm going to trust in you. <laughs> right. And it's hard, 
But, you know, Levi, we've left the fact that per, uh, persecution and suffering is a means to our sanctification. Mm. This generation wants to take a pill to forget their sorrows mm. instead of realizing suffering and hardship is good for us. Mm -hmm. It sanctifies us. Yeah, Paul said all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus <laughs> we'll, will go through persecution. So, yeah. Like you said, we're, we're forgetting that very, very easily. We are. Um, so... <clears throat> And I think I think I was going to answer <laughs> ask you about <laughs> physiological issues versus sin issues, but you're yeah. like like you're saying most of it is really just sin issues that people need to deal yeah. with. Yeah, and, and biblical counseling. One thing I've found actually exciting about counseling is being able to share the gospel because most people that come in for counseling are lost. Hmm. Most people I disciple are regenerated. It's interesting. So discipleship's more long term. Counseling usually is short term, and usually they. They don't know the gospel and so it's been a good conduit for the gospel mm -hmm. to share the gospel with uh, people that are lost so um, yeah in fact the gal sitting out there uh, she was somebody that came in for counseling and I went and she won't care me saying this because I said it in her presence and she thinks it's funny but I remember the first time I counseled I was like oh Lord Jesus help me <laughs> this, this woman's crazy and I look at her now she's memorized like 10 books of the Bible she's wow. leading she's facilitating a group at night hmm. And, you know, just seeing how the changes in her through scripture, mm -hmm. through scripture and just giving her tools and help and hope. And now they're discipling other couples in our church and she's discipling women. And I mean, it's, what a that's the beauty. That. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're reproducing yeah, yourself. Yeah, so it's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I remember the first time I was like, oh, boy, help me. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thank God, for your, thank God for your persistence and caring oh, for Oh, goodness. Her. So there are many... Well, I would say maybe not many, but there are a few women preachers out there. Beth Moore, Priscilla Schreier, Joyce Meyer. A lot of women look up to these women. They think they're amazing. They, they follow their ministries, which is why they, they make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, so you being a, a woman teacher, I'm sure, I'm sure you approve of them and are in league with them and want them to <laughs> succeed as well. No. <laughs> you want me to get more hate mail? Huh? <laughs> That's all right. <clears throat> um, every time I speak about this, I get hate mail. But it proves my point, which I have shared before. Their followers are like them. Mm. The teacher becomes like the student. And many of these that have followed, especially Beth Moore, when they write me or email me or even call me, I've had phone calls from them. Uh, they're angry. They wish me to go to hell. Mm. They're very harsh in their confrontation of me and what's so interesting they never can prove it biblically you know i'll say well you need to compare what she teaches with scripture that's all i'm asking you to do compare what she and even now you know now she's become a part of the anglican church and she's i mean she's just really lost all rationale that i'm talking about beth moore mm -hmm. <clears throat> joyce meyer actually you know joyce meyer actually teaches some truth but she also is a word of faith she believes christ died uh, to make us wealthy she mm -hmm. believes in the healing and the atonement the physical healing so that's where i would have issue with her but in all honesty i'd rather listen to her than beth mm -hmm. because beth is just to me has she's lost all rationale she makes no sense she's like uh peter talks or says they their talk is empty mm -hmm. makes no sense whereas joyce meyer still has some truth but she does have false teaching so i would categorize her as a false teacher Priscilla Schreier, <clears throat> I know a lot of people have benefited from her studies, but again, she is part of that move, and she joins hands with Beth Moore and all those ladies that are in that whole camp. Mm -hmm. But uh, the issue with her mainly that I've seen through the years is a lot of mysticism, the contemplative chanting, uh, more bordering on that line. She's not someone that I've really studied as much as I've seen with the other two ladies. Mm -hmm. So, And there's so many new ones now. Mm -hmm. I mean... You know, I don't I don't know if you saw the interview with Justin the other day with some lady where she's a new false teacher and she said Jesus actually crawled in bed with her and played with her hair. I mean, my goodness, they, these are just they're becoming more and more bizarre. And these things are nuts. Mm -hmm. who, who listens to that stuff? That's that's taking our holy Lord and making him some kind of a it's creepy. It's mm -hmm. just it's very creepy. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, it's sad because it's sad. They, they are they are super popular and they and like you said, but they're leading a lot of their followers they astray, are. and they're not really showing them biblical truth. Even though they are preaching a, a lot of things, that, like a lot of the clips, like you said, are their truth. A lot of the things yeah. they say are oh, true, yeah. but it's that poison pill that's mixed with the truth, which is really where the deadliness comes in. Which is one of the things that, like, whenever I'm you know talking or, or 
looking at videos and seeing how um, you know we got people say like this person is good they teach sound doctrine mm -hmm. I'm like the devil's not going to come and say I'm the devil you yeah know, I'm teaching you false doctrine <laughs> right. this is false doctrine right. therefore you know believe me the devil is subtle that's oh, why yeah. that's why we we're in this fall he was subtle with yep. Eve he tricked her he deceived her and so that's why we have to be on the alert and I just think oh he sounds good you know he said some true things so why am I gonna mm -hmm. you know why why should I not bother to why should I bother to d look at it, look at him yep. further and I think that's a lot of the issues that we, not just women that men, but men have as well yeah. with the people that we like to listen to. Yeah, he appears as an angel of light. Yeah, exactly. And so do his ministers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, so we know. And, and you know, I, I, I'm I thankful. I think a lot of people are coming out of Beth Moore. I mean, I see more and more saying, I used to, I used to, no more. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay. thankful for that. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful for that. Okay. Mm. So one of the, mm. I think, great compliments that I heard from... Um, Pastor Doug was, he talked about how you were, and we all know your brilliance in the scriptures, your diligence there, but he said that, uh, and this is a quote from what I remember him saying, is that the Proverbs 31 woman would be embarrassed to be in your company. <laughs> and we were like, whoa. You know? So, I mean, oh, clearly goodness. he thought highly of you. So as modestly <laughs> as you can, yeah, why, really. why do you think that he said oh, that? Oh, he so, must so. have been on drugs that night. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, Doug used to say if I died first, he'd have to get seven wives to do all I did <laughs> and my kids used to beg me mom please don't die first <laughs> so they got their wish but um you know I was brought up in a home where we were we had no television and we were taught to work and so be very disciplined both of my parents were extremely disciplined disciplined in their bodies what they ate disciplined in their time so I, I kind of just grew up that way so I've never been one to enjoy wasting time I'm I don't as John MacArthur says I have very little need for entertainment. Hmm. Or another thing I've heard him say, others may, I may not. That's kind of my mantra. I, 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 I love serving the Lord. I love being busy for the kingdom. It's not a burden, it's a joy. Hmm. And so <clears throat> I, I can multitask. I can do like three things at one time. I'm very, dis I'm just, I don't require a lot of sleep, maybe five, six hours hmm. at most. And so, um, I, I just am wired that way. I am wired to be <clears throat> disciplined and and Doug used to say, Susan, you're gonna die young because I would go to you know get up so early and and uh, he said you're you know skipping out on sleep and you're gonna die young and and so but I that's all I need about five six hours and so um, that's a high compliment he paid me. Um, I don't think she'd be intimidated <laughs> by me. We might do competition, but. Uh, I don't stay up late. I do rise up early, mm -hmm. and I am very diligent in my home. And even now that I'm a widow, I still am very diligent mm -hmm. if, in uh, in what everything I do. In fact, now that Doug's gone, I just disciple more women. <laughs> so, <laughs> Freed up more of your time. Yeah, I, I'm just, you know, I just was with my kids. I had a great time with them, but um, I'm just not one to waste time. I just never have been. And mm -hmm. don't. Yeah, I don't watch much time. since Doug's been gone. The TV, I think, has been on maybe three times. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I just don't have a lot of interest in that. So. I see. Well, being that you are busy with women and, and teaching and discipling and all and all of that, you have a ministry called With the Master. Yeah. And, and I think um, I remember hearing a story about Martin Luther, how when he was going through the, the challenges against the Roman Catholic Church that he felt like the devil was really assaulting him, even through an inkwell at the wall and because he thought the devil was, mm -hmm. was there. So I'm wondering in your ministry, I'm sure you have come against, like you said, you've been persecuted, you've come against opposition. So how has that challenged you spiritually being on, really on the forefront of uh, the spiritual wars that we are fighting today? Yeah, I've had those, ex not where I wanted to throw ink against the wall of the devil, but um, I definitely feel like it, I've been attacked many times, um, especially since Doug's been gone. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, in my mind, I've been attacked a lot um, there after I taught second Peter last year to the ladies in the church and I was on chapter two about false teachers I don't know what was going on but I was very plagued for a long time I felt like I was being attacked I felt my mind was tormented I kept examining myself you know I want to make sure I'm not in that list of all those things you know and so um, and we do De Deb and I have talked about it Deb travels with me and a lot of times we're heading to these places and she'll have all these things happen all have things happen and we're like this must going to be a good conference because the enemy's trying to discourage us. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it'll end up being where it is a wonderful conference or women are converted or something like that. And so uh, I haven't been tormented to the extent Martin Luther for sure, but, but definitely the devil, he does not like the word of the Lord to go forth, mm -hmm. period. 
he hates it. <laughs> and I'm thankful that you do have Deb, like you mentioned, and you guys have a strong friendship. You've been friends for, I think, many, many years. Yeah, probably 30 now, maybe. 30 years now. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask, how would you describe a friendship and how would you encourage other women or men just to have friends like that, that are deep, that are um, long lasting, especially in having true fellowship as she travels with you in the ministry? How would you encourage people to get friends like that and, and keep them in their lives. Yeah. I think our friendship is a lot like Paul and Timothy. You know, they were soulmates and they had a common bond in Christ. Uh, one goal to glorify him. And Debbie always wanted to be a missionary. So now she gets to be a missionary to women. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that we don't have issues. We do. We work them out quickly. You know, if you're going to travel and be with someone, we travel almost every weekend this year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you got two centers in a car together for 12 hours. Tomorrow we leave for Wisconsin and 12 hours there, 12 hours back. Wow. We're going to be in the car 24 hours. <laughs> And, you know, we have, we drive differently, we eat differently, oh, we, you know, but we listen to sermons, we disciple, uh, we will disciple women on the phone often in our car and mm. my car, her car. Um, so, but we, we endeavor, if we have an issue, we work it out quickly. You know, we, we solve it quickly. We don't stay upset and we have very few, but we're very different, but we have one common goal and that's to minister to these women. And mm. so I'd say our, our, our friendship is built on Christ and mm -hmm. honoring Him and glorifying Him. We both have a desire to help women, to work with women, and it's worked out great. Um, we both are pretty for our age. I mean, Deb's five years older than me, and she's still mm. trucking. Wow. <laughs> you know? She's trucking and moving and hauling 50-pound boxes of books. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so who knows? So yeah. we we just we have a good time together. We really do, and and uh, we don't see each other much out of sight of that because we're both busy mm -hmm. when we're home but um we work very well together to we we know yeah what our role is when we're traveling and she runs the book table and mm -hmm. i do the teaching and so <laughs> well, i'm thankful that you have that friend to travel with you and, and fight those spiritual battles yeah. with you and encourage you and even challenge you <laughs> as you guys work out your issues so <laughs> um just as we come to a close as you've been teaching you've been counseling and you've been um, just a huge blessing to the body of Christ. But all of this is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's all because of him Amen. that you are able to do what you're doing today. So could you just for the audience tell us again, what is the gospel? Well, I think the gospel is a couple things. <laughs> it is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. He was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Mm -hmm. But I also believe within that is not just a mental assent to those facts, because the demons believe and tremble. Mm -hmm. But I believe the gospel is, as Paul and Peter many times said in Acts, repent and believe the gospel. So repentance has to be a part of it. Turning away, you're going one way and you make a U-turn and go the other way. You turn from your sin. You turn from your sin, you turn to the Savior. You turn from leading your life to letting the Lord lead your life. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, there's repentance involved and there's a turning over your life to a new master, no longer a slave to sin, but a slave to Christ. Mm. And I don't think we share that part. Uh, we like the fact that Christ died for us and we want to go to heaven, but we don't want to give up our rights. We don't want to give up our, our mastery. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say there's got to be repentance and there's got to be a giving over of one's life to the Lordship of Christ, besides just a mental assent to the truth. It's got to take root in the heart. Exactly. It's, and I think, mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know if it was Steve Lawson that said the hardest distance is to get it from your head to your heart, mm -hmm. you know, the longest eight inches or whatever. And I think a lot of people can ascend to Jesus dying on the mm -hmm. cross and, oh, yeah. and being buried and raising again. We just celebrated Easter weekend and uh, people all over the world, especially in our country, mm -hmm. real, understand what that, um, what Easter is mm -hmm. about, you know, at least some kind of mental mm -hmm. uh, understanding of it. But as far as, like you said, dying to yourself, mm -hmm. becoming a slave to Christ, knowing that you mm -hmm. are no longer your own, that you are bought at a price, and that you have to glorify God in your body. I think that's what really doesn't penetrate our hearts. And like you said, we have to share that, uh, yeah. that other part of the gospel. I'm glad that you shared that with us today, and I'm glad you were able to come today and, and tell us about the, what the Lord is doing in your life. So, Susan, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. You're welcome. God bless. All right. Thank you. <laughs>